Okay, here's something. I'm going to tell you a lot of things, and you might just forget some of those things, but some of those things will stick with you, and those will really be important, and those are going to kind of found the foundation of whatever your, whichever field you're going into. So let's look at anatomy first. Anatomy is the study of the structure of the body, and since we're doing the human body, it's the study of the structure of the human body. And we divide it into various branches. These are a few of them. First is gross anatomy. Gross anatomy is also called macroscopic, which means what you can see with the naked eye. So gross anatomy is also called macroscopic, as opposed to microscopic. Under macroscopic, you can study gross anatomy region by region. That means you do the head and neck region, you do the thoracic region, you do the abdominal region, then you do the pelvic region. That's called regional anatomy. Regional anatomy is usually good when we are studying with cadavers, like for dissection, because when we kind of dissect this head area, we study everything in that area, all the blood vessels, all the muscles, all the organs, all the glands. So, but... In this class, we are not going to do regional anatomy. We don't use cadavers. What we are going to do is systemic anatomy. Systemic means we go system by system. So, for example, we will do uh, integumentary system, and then we'll do skeletal system, and then we do muscular system, nervous system. So that we go system by system. So we learn structures in that particular system. We also have a part of gross anatomy. We don't do too much of it, which is called surface anatomy. And surface anatomy is being able to project internal structures to the outside of the body. So, for example, when you go to a doctor's office and, you know, the doctor kind of feels for your throat up here and you say, I have a sore throat and they're feeling here, they're not really feeling your tonsils. What they're actually feeling is there are lymph nodes which kind of drain the tonsil. So if you had an infection... The ton that lymph node would be inflamed. So if they see that the lymph node is really big, then they say, okay, this person probably had repeated attacks of tonsillitis. You've all heard of people with appendicitis, right? You've heard, heard or seen movies and stuff like that. So a person with appendicitis usually will point to pain in an area of the body on the right side in the lower area which is called the right iliac fossa because if we were to project the appendix to the outer surface of the body that's where the appendix would be okay so it's being able to project the internal organs to the surface of the body that's surface anatomy then we have microscopic anatomy which is where you look on at the various tissues and cells under the microscope so this is also known as histology and we'll be doing some of it in the lab then we have developmental embryology, uh, developmental anatomy or embryology, where we kind of study the development from the time of conception to time of birth. Though development occurs after birth as well, embryology basically is the study from conception till the time the child is born. Okay, so that's that. We don't do that in this class, but often I will kind of just give you a few pointers. This happens because embryologically this was what was happening. So I kind of give you a reason why some things are the way they are in the body because it's based on the development of that structure. Then we have radiographic anatomy. Nowadays that's really, really important. You've heard of people having CT scans, you know, general x-rays, ultrasounds, PETs, uh, magnetic resonance imaging. So there's so much. So all of this comes under radiographic anatomy where you kind of can look at sections. You're using sound waves for ultrasound or you're using x-rays, for example, regular x-rays and so on. Okay. We, again, don't do too much of it. Sometimes I will show you a few radiographs, uh, especially when we are doing the skeletal system. I'll kind of show you a young child and an old, uh, older person or an adult, say, for example, the hand, where I show you how some of the bones are still not formed in a young child, but the bones are, you know, formed in an adult, and I'll show you the difference. A clinical anatomy. This is being able to use your anatomical knowledge to tell or to apply that anatomical knowledge to various problems that a person might present with. 
And I use a lot of clinical anatomy within my course. So I tell when I'm teaching anything, I will tell you, this is why a person will present with this kind of a problem. Say, for example, I tell you a person presents with sore throat. That is because the epithelium in his throat is inflamed. When the epithelium is inflamed and you swallow something, that inflamed tissue gets bruised. And so that's why the person presents with sore throat. So I'm kind of trying to explain. I teach you epithelium, but I also try to tell you what happens in everyday life, what you go through. So kind of applying your concepts of anatomy and physiology to what you're studying. That's clinical anatomy. This is surface anatomy. So in surface anatomy, one is also knowing what these various structures are named in the body. We don't use, uh, for example, we don't just say nose, we don't say hip. Uh, we don't say fingers, we say digits for fingers, for the hips, we, hip we say coxal for example, nares for nose, oral for the mouth, um, big toe for example you can see here is called the hallux, the thumb is called the pollux, you can see here, we don't, we use, say this is the palmar surface of the hand, so these are all little um, terms which you should know, you can't memorize all of this in one day in one sitting right now, I would suggest that kind of try to look at this, this particular slide often and look at these and, you know, use, use this, um, this thing to kind of, you know, talk to each other like that. So, for example, if you look up here, uh, look at what the front of the, this area of the thigh is called. It's called femoral because the femur is lying there. You notice that? Okay. Um, this lap, this side of the uh, leg is called fibular because that's where the fibula bone is present. So notice up here what the arm is called. Notice what the forearm is called. Okay, so you can see that. So you can see some things here. Look at the hand. It's called manus. So when, you know, loosely when you, in everyday language, when you say leg, you actually mean the entire lower limb. But when you look at it, or lower extremity. But actually leg is just from below the knee until the ankle. But, but, you know, when you say, I hurt my leg, it could be anywhere from your thigh to your toe, right? But actually, when you say leg in anatomy, leg is only from the, the knee joint to the ankle joint. Only this area is called, this part is called the leg. This back portion is called the calf, but otherwise only that area is called the leg. So having looked at this picture, now here's the first question that I'm asking you. Using your clickers, answer this question. What do you think the brachium refers to? And I kind of pointed it out to you in that um, you can change your answers. It'll always just register the last answer that you choose. So it's very important for you to look at the PowerPoint pictures very, very carefully. Yes. Um, just go with the person sitting next to you and, you know, ask them, like, tell them which answer you would choose and see which they would. Uh, I don't have enough of these clickers, okay? So if you don't have a clicker in your head, think, okay, that's the answer I would choose. And I'll tell you what the correct answer is, and then you would get right. Okay, you have to get it in fast, because I'm not going to wait for everybody to sign in. Otherwise, I'll be waiting all day. Okay, very good. The brachium is, called, is refers to the arm. That's why that there's an artery present here in the arm, and that artery is called the brachial artery because this is the brachium, okay? The leg is not the brachium. The leg is either called fibular or tibial, and the back is called sural. So we did anatomy. Physiology is the function of the structures of the body. So again, there are some, there are many types of physiology. Here are some examples. Renal physiology is the, phys the function of the urinary system, and especially the kidneys. Neurophysiology is the function of the brain and the nerves. Cardiovascular physiology, the heart and blood vessels. Musculoskeletal, as you can see, would obviously be muscles and skeletal systems. So you can have so many other types of physiology. Gastrointestinal physiology for the gastrointestinal, the digestive system. So physiology is the function. 
So if you know the structure of an, an organ or the structure of a particular part, it's always easy to correlate the function with it because they go hand in hand. So let's look at how our body is actually organized. So we begin with really small structures which are known as atoms. When atoms get together, at the chemical level these are atoms, they get together and they form larger structures which are known as molecules. Molecules then come together to make cells and there are four different types of cells in the body. The four different types of cells in the body are epithelial cells, connective tissue cells, so this is epithelial cell, here's connective tissue cell, nerve cells, and muscle cells. So these are the four types of cells in the body. When similar types of cells come together, you get tissues. So when similar, when cells performing the same function and are similar in structure, when they come together, you get tissues. So here, for example, you can see the tissues. So when epithelial cells come together, you get epithelial tissue. So then the tissue would be called epithelial tissue. When connective tissue cells come together, you would get connective tissue. When nerve cells get together, you get nervous tissue. And when muscle cells come together, as is shown up here, you get muscle tissue. Okay? So when similar cells come together, you get a type of tissue. And the, so therefore, the tissues also will only be of four types. Now, when tissues of different types of tissues get together, you get an organ. So when different tissues come together, you get an organ. So an organ is made up of dissimilar tissues or tissues of different types. So for example, here it's showing you a blood vessel. So in a blood vessel, you will have the inner lining which is made up of epithelial tissue. Then you have a little bit of connective tissue present both outside and inside. You also have muscle tissue which surrounds uh, the epithelium and it kind of helps a blood vessel contract or relax. And blood vessels are also supplied by nerves, so they have nerve tissue as well. So can you see in this case a blood vessel has all four tissue types, okay? Then when organs performing the same function get together, they form an organ system. So for example, using this same thing, like here this was a blood vessel which transports blood, nutrients and gases. When it comes together with the heart, which does the same thing, they together form the cardiovascular system, okay? And then organ systems, when many organs come together, then you get the final organism. So, for example, in this case, it would be the human being, okay? So, from small to big, you can see atoms, molecules, cells, tissues, organ, organ system, and then um, the final organism. Each organ system has a particular function, but one organ system doesn't necessarily have to have the same function as the other, okay? So here are the organ systems. I'm not going to go through this whole list because your book, this is where you will re use your book. In your book, there's a very nice uh, picture uh, which kind of shows you all the organ systems which the various organs in it, giving you the functions of that. So I suggest you take time and go through that. But I'll kind of give you just a general idea. For example, cardiovascular system transports blood, nutrients, and gases to the tissues from the lungs. Respiratory system is for exchange of gases. Um, integumentary system, which includes the skin and all of the accessory organs, protects, and when we do each system, we'll kind of go into more detail. Um, it kind of helps with uh, maintaining body temperature. It also helps to for vitamin D. So it kind of interacts with other systems as well. Um, skeletal system forms the framework. Lymphatic system, that helps in the defense of the body. Endocrine system, that's a system which produces hormones which go to other parts and help for the body to function normally. Okay? 
So go through your book and read through the various organ systems and all the organs which are present in them. In ANP1, we will be doing the integumentary system. We'll be doing the skeletal, muscular, and nervous system. And in the other systems, we, when you do ANP2, we do that. Now, to answer your question, you ask, do all the systems have the same function? They don't have the same function. But they have to work together because only if they work together do they ca actually enhance the function of the other system. And that's what I mean by no organ system is an island. That means it cannot function just by itself. It has to help and seek help from the other organ systems. So let's take an example. Let's say we were discussing the musculoskeletal system. Uh, its function is providing framework and the muscular system is for movement. But... It requires the nervous system because the nervous system makes the muscular system act. It causes muscle contraction, right? So if the, nervous, if the nerve supply to the muscle was gone, then the muscle would not act. So can you see then this mus muscular system is dependent on that. If the skeletal system was fractured, then the muscles would say a bone was fractured. The muscles in relation to the bone would not be able to act because that bone is fractured at that point, right? So you can see how they are interacting with each other. Also, both musculoskeletal, both muscle and skeletal systems need blood supply because they are alive. They need a rich blood supply. If the blood supply to that area is cut, the muscle will die as will the bone. So they need the cardiovascular system to be functioning. They also need the respiratory system to be functioning because cardiovascular system transports the gases. But if someone had respiratory problems, they're not exchanging gases properly. What will happen? You're not getting enough oxygen to the tissues, so the muscles will die. So can you see you need both cardiovascular and respiratory systems to be functioning normally. And muscles, when they contract, they produce waste products. Those waste products have to be rid from the body. You know, like when you run, sometimes you feel soreness. That's because of lactic acid buildup. So that has to be removed from the body, which is done by the excretory or the urinary system. If that is not functioning, what will happen? These waste products build up in your body and you would end up with toxicity. Right? So can you see all these organ systems kind of have to work with one another. They can't just work by themselves. If one system is disturbed, it affects the internal environment of all the other systems and it affects what is known as homeostasis. And we'll be looking at homeostasis very soon. And I'll explain when we come to that. So these are some of the characteristics of any living organism. It has a boundary. It's contained. You know, you're just not flowing all over the place. Capable of movement. Capable of reacting to the external environment, which shows up as irritability. They take in substances, digest and metabolize those substances. And that's how an, a living organism gives itself energy to carry out its various functions. While they're doing all this, they also produce waste, which they must get rid of in the body. So excretion is a function. Living organisms also tend to reproduce. And they grow. Now, growth may stop after some time, but in the beginning, there is some growth. The more evolved a tissue gets, the less the growth is. So during fetal life, for example, all the, all the four tissues are growing. Epithelial, connective, muscular, and nervous tissue. But muscular and nervous tissue become highly evolved. So then when after birth, if they are damaged in some parts, they do not regenerate. They die there. But in the beginning, they still grew. Okay? So based on these characteristics, here's a question that I would like to you to answer of these necessary functions which do you think is not required for an individual survival Okay, well, half the class got it right. Reproduction. You don't need to maintain boundaries. You can't just be flowing all over the place, okay? You have to maintain boundaries. 
you have to metabolize because when you take in nutrients you have to metabolize them otherwise if you do not break them down you cannot make energy for your body <coughs> reproduction is not essential for a living structure and one good example in the body is the red blood cell so the red blood cell is a living cell does not reproduce once it comes in once it's flowing in the blood vessels the red blood cell has a limited lifespan of 120 days it dies but your bone marrow which is present in the in the bones that bone marrow produces more red cells and then throws them out the red cells come into into the circulation they live for 120 days and they die so reproduction you can see up here is not necessary see you suppose somebody decides i'm not going to have a child you can still survive can't you right so reproduction is not a function that is necessary for survival here are some important elements and things which are needed for maintaining life oxygen you definitely need oxygen because oxygen is taken into the body goes to the tissues and oxygen is used to produce energy you need water you need nutrients and you need a normal body temperature and as we go along we'll see how all of these are become really really important to maintain life so i won't go into too much detail on each one of these but we'll be discussing normal body temperature when we discuss something known as homeostasis so remember i told you if the organ systems did not work well with one another homeostasis was uh, disturbed what homeostasis is is maintaining the internal environment of the body at a constant level so for example your normal body temperature mean keeping your normal body temperature the way it is making sure you're passing the normal amount of urine every day making sure that you are not dehydrated okay making sure the ph of your blood the amount of acid in your blood is kept normal your ph of your blood is between 7.35 to 7.45 so we want to make sure that's always kept normal so that is what is main, meant by homeostasis so maintaining the constancy of the internal environment of the body when one system kind of malfunctions your homeostasis is disturbed and the body tries to get it back to normal the two systems which are primarily involved in keeping your body's homeostasis constant are nervous and endocrine while all systems are involved but the nervous and endocrine systems are primarily involved in maintaining this constancy so let's see some examples so let's say regulation of body temperature remember we said body, keeping the body temperature normal was one important thing that we needed so suppose your body temperature is very hot now it's winter but on a hot summer day you're walking and it's really hot outside and your body temperature went up you could get really hot if you get very very hot and your body temperature goes up enzymes in your body stop functioning if those enzymes in your body stop functioning normal body functions would suffer so you can't have that happen so when your body temperature goes up in your brain there is a structure which is known as the hypothalamus that senses this increase in normal body temperature it sends messages to the sympathetic nervous system and you start sweating as you sweat the water the sweat cools as uh, sweat evaporates and your body temperature comes down okay so can you see how your body has automatically done something to bring back your body temperature to normal so even though you're walking out on a hot day your body you don't start running a fever right your body temperature still kind of remains normal because all of these things are happening imagine take another situation so let me go back take another situation now it's cold so what happens when you're really cold then again the hypothalamus senses that that your body temperature has fallen say you went out into the snow and you know you were covered but not well protected so you you know you start your body temperature begins to fall the hypothalamus senses that and then what it does is it goes and stimulates the muscular system it also stimulates the sympathetic nervous system but this time the sympathetic nervous system does something different it goes and constricts the blood vessels so you may have seen on a very very cold day people look very pale because the blood vessels in their skin are very constricted so they look pale and heat is not lost from the surface of the body they don't sweat 
At the same time, by stimulating the muscular system, you begin to shiver. When you shiver, heat is generated, so your body temperature goes up. So you can see how the hypothalamus helps to keep your body temperature constant. Okay? Now, that, there we have the hypothalamus and the sympathetic nervous system. They both belonged to just the nervous system. Here we are going to look at a situation where the endocrine system, remember I said endocrine system was involved in homeostasis, endocrine and nervous. Here when the endocrine system is involved, it releases hormones. Hormones are always released in very small quantities. They go into a target organ, do their job, and then the hormone has to be turned off because otherwise the cycle will go on and on and on. You don't want that to happen. So we actually have some sort of a stimulus which goes and attaches to something on a target organ. The thing that it attaches to is called a receptor. From that receptor, an impulse goes to a control center. The control center sends another impulse, and you end up getting a response from muscle or a gland, which is known as the effector. So let's put all of this up here. So let's say somebody was starved. So they hadn't eaten. Let's say you had breakfast and then you, didn't have, you hadn't eaten for two days. So you're starved. So starvation is the stimulus. So through blo your blood glucose levels will fall. Okay, That will stimulate and go the pancreas. And in the pancreas, we have certain cells which are called alpha cells of the pancreas. So this pancreas acts as the control center and the alpha cells in the pancreas are the receptors they immediately secrete a hormone which is known as glucagon. What glucagon does is it goes to the liver, which would be the effector. It goes to the liver and causes glucose to be released from the liver. So liver releases glucose because it stores glucose in the form of something known as glycogen. Glucose from the liver is released and your blood glucose levels rise. Now, when your blood glucose levels rise, the stimulus is gone because, you know, your blood glucose levels are not low. So now you want to turn off this glucagon. Otherwise, what will happen? It began low. Now your blood glucose levels keep rising. You don't want that to happen, right? The moment the blood glucose levels come back to normal, it no longer stimulates the pancreas, which no longer produces glucagon. So your blood glucose levels are prevented from rising even further. They just come to normal. So can you see in the beginning there was a positive effect and after the result that you wanted was achieved, the effect was negative. This kind of thing is known as a negative feedback mechanism. This happens very often with the endocrine system with a lot of things that happen in our body. So for example, let's say your basal metabolism is very, very low. The thyroid gland is stimulated. You produce a hormone. Your metabolism picks up. Your body temperature and everything comes to normal, the gland is switched off. So you can see a negative feedback mechanism coming along. Okay? So this happens all the time in your body. Sometimes, only sometimes, in the body you have something which is called positive feedback. That means you have a stimulus, it produces, it goes and produces an effect, and that effect kind of keeps going like a loop. It goes on and on and on. This is not an ongoing process. That means this does not happen in daily life. It only happens in certain situations during our lifetime. One example is when a mother is, when a woman is in labor. Because what happens when she's in labor? You want her to push the baby out, right? So you want the uterine contractions to be, to keep going and till the baby is pushed out, you want that thing to happen. While the mother is nursing a baby, and I'll show you this example, or even when clotting of blood occurs. So you want clotting to occur till a well-formed clot is formed. So this is called positive feedback. So can you understand this doesn't happen every day in life? Every day a woman doesn't, during her lifetime, a woman is not in labor every day, right? Neither is she nursing her baby all the time. And neither does do all of us have bleeding on neither one of us. Oh, let me say that again. Neither are we bleeding every day requiring for clot to happen. We bleed once in a while. When we do, the clotting mechanism kicks in. It's a positive feedback till a, posit uh, till a big clot is formed and then it switches off. Okay? So you can see that positive feedback mechanisms are not an ongoing process. So let's look at an, ex at an example of a woman nursing her baby. 
she begins to nurse her baby when the baby suckles it stimulates oxytocin and hormone which is a present in the uh, stored in the pituitary gland and another hormone called prolactin from the pituitary gland both of them go to the breast tissue they increase milk production and they increase ejection of milk so she produces more milk and more milk is poured out the more milk she produces the more the baby nurses the more the baby nurses the more this these two hormones are produced and the more milk she produces so can you see like it's a loop which goes on and on till she weans her baby off and then it stops okay so this is known as positive feedback an important thing to remember is unlike negative feedback which occurs every day in our life positive only occurs sometimes and it's not an ongoing process when in our body negative feedback mechanisms which should be negative feedback do not work properly and they be actually become positive then we have homeostatic imbalance so sometimes you may have heard of people suffering from uh, let's say uh, let me give you an example um, have you heard of a condition called graves disease or uh, hyperthyroidism right hyperthyroidism so that's where the thyroid gland is not switched off it just keeps producing the hormone so when it produces more than the normal hormone what happens the effects that the hormone do which carry the effects that the hormone carry out they get hyper like that they get overstimulated or over exaggerated so the person's uh, thyroid gland for example helps you to maintain your body temperature but if you producing more thyroid hormone what happens your body temperature rises even more so the people start feeling very hot and they begin to sweat so when normal negative feedback mechanisms don't work properly you get a homeostatic imbalance so here let's look at a question that we have so which of the following do you think is an example of a negative feedback mechanism okay the correct answer is number 3 now let's look here look at this question it says labor uterine contractions begin oxytocin continuously rise to further stimulate more contractions so see it's, it's saying that more contractions are occurring the word more is there look at this one it says this person suffers from this condition they have high thyroid hormone levels and large gland due to continuous thyroid gland stimulation see the word continuous over there that means a gland is never being shut off it just keeps going on and on which is what i told you just now where there was a malfunction look at this one which says low blood calcium causes parathormone to be secreted this parathormone levels decrease when blood calcium reaches normal levels so see in the in the beginning there's low blood calcium you get this hormone this hormone causes calcium levels to reach normal and then it's turned off so can you see this so that's why this is a negative feedback mechanism have you followed okay okay we'll just begin a little bit uh with um some terms so this is the anatomical position it is as if a person is standing like i am standing right now straight looking straight at you feet by the side uh, erect and my hands by my side like this with the palms facing forward okay so this is the anatomical position and this is a standard position from which we kind of use different anatomical terms whether the organ is present inside our body or outside our body we have to use it in the anatomical position and we have to kind of relate it to other structures in the anatomical position so like i gave an example in the lab so the kidneys lie facing each other and they lie they are bean shaped structures kind of flat in the middle part of the abdomen 
So when the, there's an upper portion of the kidney and there's a lower end to the kidney. So when I take the kidneys out of the body, whether I turn it left, right, sideways and all, the upper end would be the upper end that it would be in the anatomical position. Okay? So that's what is meant by the standard position. So based on this standard position, first thing is two terms we use is this torso area is called axial. So this torso area is called axial. Anything to do with this is axial. For example, axial skeleton, axial musculature. So muscles of the head, neck, the chest, and the trunk belong to axial mus muscles. The skull, the vertebrae, the ribs, they belong to axial skeleton. Anything to do with the limbs or what are called extremities are known as appendicular. Because our limbs develop as appendages from the body. As an appendage is a little structure which sticks out. So when a fetus is developing, this is what the fetus looks like. That's the head and here's where the eyes will develop. So your limbs develop on the side like this, as little appendages, like little flippers. And they stick out. So anything to do with the limbs is known as appendicular. So we have planes and section. A plane is just a flat surface that passes through the body and divides it into surfaces or pieces. Okay? So section is what is obtained after you pass this plane. So here you can see that you can have a plane which goes right through the center of the body, which will be called mid-sagittal. Anything which is parallel to it is known as just sagittal or also called parasagittal. The word para means by the side of. Then we have a plane which you can see here going across this way in such a way that it divides the body into a front portion and a back portion. Such a plane is known as the frontal plane or also known as the coronal plane. This sagittal is named because of a suture which is planed, placed in the center of the skull like this called the sagittal suture. The coronal plane is named because, again, there's a suture which goes across like this, which is called the coronal suture. And then we can have a transverse plane, which is also called horizontal, and we'll see later how they don't mean the same always, where it goes through the body in such a way that it divides it into an upper portion and a lower portion. Okay? So we'll stop here. Okay, so we described the three planes, sagittal, which we said you could go right in the middle, which, where you call it mid-sagittal, or you also call it the median plane, because anything to do with the midline, me, median plane. So right in the midline, divides it into right and left equal halves. Anything which is parallel to this mid-sagittal or median plane is known as parasagittal. Para means by the side of. So that will just divide it into right and left sides, not equal portions. So you can have many parasagittal planes. A coronal or frontal plane, remember I said it's based on the coronal suture here, just as sagittal was named for the sagittal suture present in the midline. So coronal divides the body. So when you take coronal, you can take many coronal sections like that, going through using different coronal planes. It divides the part that you're sectioning, or if you're doing the whole body, into a part in front and a part at the back. Then we have a horizontal section. A horizontal section goes from uh, the plane, when you use the plane, which is an imaginary surface, you take the plane from front to back like this, so it divides, for example, up here. So you take it from front to back. So it divides the part, or if you're doing it for the whole body, it divides it into an upper and a lower portion. For example, in this picture here, this is a horizontal section going from front to back, dividing the body into an upper or lower. Here it's dividing the limb into an upper or lower portion. Now, if there is anything in the body that is vertically placed, then the horizontal and transverse section is the same thing. By definition, a horizontal plane goes from front to back and divides the part into two sections, an upper section and a lower section. Got it? Mm -hmm. Transverse, by definition, 
the transverse by definition is if, we, if I talk of a transverse plane, it's an imaginary surface that we use to cut the part and we use it in a direction perpendicular to the long axis. Perpendicular to the long axis of the structure that we are cutting. By long axis, I mean length. Okay? So, for anything that is vertically placed in the body, so let's look at this here. So, a horizontal section, as I said, the plane goes from front to back and the sections we get are an upper and a lower section. Now, in, when you're standing erect in the anatomical position, this is the long axis of your body, right? And we said a transverse plane goes perpendicular to the long axis. So, that also would cut this way. So, that also will be dividing the part into an upper section and a lower section. So, for anything that is vertically placed in the body, a horizontal and transverse means the same thing. Got that? But there are certain things that are not placed horizontally in the body, such as, for example, here, this is the pancreas. So, a horizontal plane always goes from front to back, dividing it into an upper and a lower section. Transverse, on the other hand, by our definition, is perpendicular to the long axis or length. So, here in this structure which is placed across the body in the anatomical position, this is the pancreas. This is the length of this structure, right? So, when we take a transverse plane and it goes across like this, perpendicular to it, so it will go in this direction, perpendicular to it. Notice how it will divide it into a right and a left portion. Do you see that? So, for structures which are horizontally placed in the body, the transverse is not the same as horizontal. Okay? So, let's take a look at this picture. So, suppose you got this picture. Identify the body section. So, you should have taken the clickers. So, using your clickers, identify the body section. What type of section do you think is this? Is it a sagittal section, a coronal section, transverse or horizontal? This picture, using this picture, tell me what kind of section has been obtained in this. Okay, you've got to be a little faster answering. Very good. Yes, it is a sagittal section. It is not a coronal section. And here's why. So here you, this is why you must be, you must look at images very, very carefully. Look at this. What do you think this is? the spinal column, right? The vertebral column, which is on the posterior aspect. This here is the front or the anterior abdominal wall. They've also shown you the mammary gland up here. If you paid attention, you can see that, which is on the front. So, this is the front portion and this is the back portion. So, it has been cut through like this and they've just taken that and turned it around and put it up there for you to see. So, you can see in a sagittal section, if there are structures which are placed on both sides, like if you have two kidneys, you'll only see one kidney in that section. Do you get that? Okay. So, this is a sagittal section. Here, the liver has been cut in half. Here is the uh, stomach. Here are the loops of the small intestine. Here is the urinary bladder, the uterus, and the rectum. So, they've all been sectioned right through the middle. So, this is a sagittal section. Okay. About this question, would the transverse and horizontal sections of a rib be the same? So, think of how ribs are placed in your body.
Very good. No is the correct answer. No, they would not be the same. And here's why. Ribs in your body are not placed vertically. Your ribs don't lie like this, right? They are placed horizontally or actually obliquely if, if you want to be really technical. So if you look at a rib, this is how a rib is. Right? That's the posterior end of the rib and this is the front end of the rib. So if I take a horizontal plane through the rib, by definition a horizontal plane goes from front to back. So what will it do? It will divide this rib into an upper part. Suppose I just take this part and it will divide the rib into a lower part, right? A transverse section is perpendicular to the long axis or length. This is the length of the rib. So if I cut a section through, this is what a transverse section would look like. Here's the rest of the rib. Do you see that? How they would not be the same, okay? So let's look at some other terms that we use in anatomy and get used to using these terms. You can combine these terms. And another thing to remember about some of these terms are that they are relative. So let's look at the first one, which I already told you. Median means right in the midline. Medial means anything close to the midline. Lateral means anything further away from the midline. And intermediate obviously means something in between. So if we look at these three structures, the eye, let's say your cheek and your ear, we can say that the eye is medial to the cheek and the ears. The cheek is intermediate while the ears are lateral, right? And if I compare your ear with the shoulder, I can say that the ear is medial to the shoulder. So can you, say, can you see that how this becomes very relative? While the ear is lateral to the eye, it is medial to the shoulder. So you have to look in anatomical position and the, depending on which structures you're comparing, the position, the relationship can change. When we look at the limbs... In the case of the upper limb and in the case of the lower limb, so if I was to draw a person up here, okay, and here's the upper limb. In the forearm, on the medial side, in the forearm, on the medial side is a bone which is known as the ulna. In the leg, the bone on the medial side, and I've kind of not, I should draw it this way. The bone on the medial side in the leg is the tibia. So therefore, in the forearm and in the leg, instead of using the word medial and lateral, medial, we can use the word ulnar for the forearm, we can use the word tibial for the leg or anything to do with the lower limb. So I'll give you an example. So if you take my entire upper limb like this and I find that there is an artery which is lying on the medial side of my arm and it's lying in the forearm or it's even lying in the hand on the medial side. I could say that this artery, let, let me just take an artery called the brachial artery. I could say the brachial artery lies medial to let's say a nerve called the median nerve. Or I could also say the brachial artery is ulnar compared to the median nerve. Do you see that? Because the word ulnar for the upper limb is synonymous with medial because of this bone which is present up here in the forearm. In my leg, on the other hand, let's say I have a muscle present here called tibialis anterior. So in the entire lower limb or if I just wanted to use the leg portion, I could say the tibialis anterior lies on the tibial side or is tibial compared to peroneus longus, which is another muscle. Do you see that? Okay. So you can use the word ulnar for the entire upper limb. You can use the word tibial for the entire lower limb in place of medial. Got that? You cannot use tibial for the upper limb and ulnar for the lower limb. You can only use it for the limb in which that bone lies. Similarly, in the upper limb, there is a bone called the radius on the lateral side and a bone called the fibula on the lateral side in the case of the lower limb. So, we 
these two words radial and fibular are synonymous with the word lateral okay so i could say the median nerve is radial compared to the brachial artery because it's lying lateral to the brachial artery you see that okay so this is for the limbs then we have a term we have two terms which are to do with how whether the structure is lying in front or towards the front of the body or towards the back of the body so when any structure lies towards the back of the body we say it is posterior or the other word we use is dorsal any structure lying closer to the front of the body we use the word anterior or we use the word ventral this dorsal and ventral are typically true synonyms for posterior and anterior only for the trunk region later when we do the limbs i'll tell you why they are not synonymous for other parts of the body like for the lower limb especially they are not synonymous but for now you take it as posterior is the same as dorsal anterior is the same as ventral so if we look at these three structures here this is a transverse section taken through the trunk area and let me say here so i can say a is anterior to b and c b is anterior to c while where c is posterior to a and b and the reason i'm saying this is in case you haven't followed why what do you think this structure is here that is a vertebra that has been cut through right and we know the vertebrae are present on the back which means the posterior aspect of the body this here is a cut section of the sternum or the breast bone so this is towards the front this is towards the back so therefore we can see that the sternum is anterior most this blood vessel called aorta is kind of intermediate and the vertebra up here is posterior most if i was just to compare these three structures got it other terms we use superior and inferior superior and inferior are again used for the trunk region when i say trunk i mean your head your neck your torso that means everything head neck this whole torso everything ex except for the limbs okay superior means closer to the head end of the body inferior means closer to the lower aspect of the body towards the feet or towards the tail end of the body we also use the words cranial and cephalic cephalic means to do with the head so we can use the word superior or cranial or cephalic inferior we, the another word we use for inferior is called caudal cauda means tail so that means towards the tail end of the body which means going down towards the lower end of the body so to give you an example your nose is superior to your mouth your chin is inferior to your mouth got that okay in the nervous system anything lying in front we use the word rostral but closer towards the nose we use the word rostral and that's only for the nervous system so when we do the nervous system we may use that term what is that closer towards the nose front two terms which are similar to superior and inferior but we don't use the word superior and inferior this is for the limbs for your upper and lower limbs proximal is all almost similar to superior distal is almost similar to inferior but instead of using the head end and the tail end in the case of the limbs we use the reference point as the attached end of the limb or what's called the root of the limb for example your entire upper limb is attached to the torso at the shoulder your entire lower limb is attached to the torso at the hip so anything closer to the shoulder in the upper limb would be called proximal as compared to anything which is further away from the shoulder that would be called distal for example my elbow is proximal to my wrist the fingers are distal to the wrist and the elbow okay same goes for the lower limb the knee is distal to the hip joint the hip is proximal to the knee so you can't use the word superior and inferior because that's anatomically not correct you have to use the words proximal and distal 
the only time when you have some sort of anatomical leeway is when if you are studying bones and since we study bones outside of the body like when you study bones you take the bones out and then you look at them so there it's anatomically not incorrect to say like let's say you take the uh, the bone of the arm which is called the humerus and you hold the humerus you you should be saying this is the proximal end of the humerus and this is the distal end of the humerus. But you could also say that this is the superior end of the humerus and this is the inferior end only because you use the bone outside of the body. Okay, So you, it, you may find many books giving, uh, they, some books will give it as proximal radio ulna joint and distal radio ulna joint. But others might give it as superior radio ulna joint and inferior radio ulna joint. And you would think, oh, this is anatomically not correct because anything to do with the limb should have the word proximal and distal. But just because bones are studied outside of the body, so a slight amount of leeway is given. Though we should still try and stick to proximal and distal. Then some special terms for your hand. This aspect of your hand is known as the palmer aspect and the sole of your foot is called the plantar aspect. So you may have heard of people who suffer from a condition called plantar fasciitis, right? Where there is a thick membrane which is present in the sole of the foot and that gets inflamed, causes a lot of pain. So that's called plantar fasciitis because the sole is called plantar surface. Superficial and deep are two terms which are used and the reference point is skin. Anything which is closer to the skin is called superficial. Anything which is further away from the skin is called um, deep. For example, I would say muscles are superficial compared to bone. Or subcutaneous fat is superficial compared to muscles. Now, organs, when you take an organ, especially when an organ has a hollow structure, like you take the stomach or the small intestine. We don't use the word superficial and deep because all of the stomach is away from the skin. So when you kind of have hollow structures and you open up the hollow structure, so let's say this is the stomach and you're looking at the outer aspect of the stomach. We say this outer aspect of the stomach is known as the external surface. So for organs, instead of, instead of using superficial and deep, the outer aspect of the organ is called external. And if this organ was opened up, so now let's say I opened up the stomach. So here's the wall of the stomach that I'm seeing. And then I look inside the cavity of the stomach, it's kind of folded. This would be called the deep aspect. So the cavity would be the deep aspect of the, oh, sorry, um, not deep, internal aspect of the stomach. And the outer part of the stomach would be called the external aspect of the stomach. Okay? Internal and external only with organs, yes. And here you can see proximal and distal as examples. Here you can see superficial. This is superficial compared to something this has been cut and you can see a deeper structure inside here. Next, after knowing all this terminology, let's kind of go further inside. Now we're going inside the body and we find that there are a lot of cavities inside the body which house important structures. Some of these cavities are extremely well protected, others not so much. So let's look at two, cav two major divisions. There is this yellow cavity which you see towards the back of the body or the posterior aspect of the body and then this part which is more towards the anterior aspect of the body. So we call this entire part the dorsal body cavity, this the ventral body cavity. Okay, so this is the dorsal body cavity, this is the ventral body cavity. The dorsal body cavity has is extremely well protected because it has the skull and the vertebral column you can see up here surrounding the cavity. This dorsal body cavity is further divided into two, continuous with one another. The upper portion is called the cranial cavity which houses the brain and the lower portion is called the vertebral or also known as the spinal cavity which has the spinal cord in it. Very important structures, that's why you have this hard bone surrounding it, so that's well protected. 
they don't move much so you you can have a hard structure outside to keep them in place the ventral body cavity here is divided into two parts by a sheet of muscle which goes right across from the sternum in front from the ribs on the side and from the vertebral column it's like holding an umbrella inside if i was to stand inside up here and open an umbrella and held it and it completely kind of divided this cavity into a portion above the diaphragm and below the diaphragm that sheet of muscle is called the diaphragm so here the sheet of muscle is known as the diaphragm so it divides it into a cavity above which is known as the thoracic cavity and a part below which is called abdominal pelvic and the abdominal pelvic can be further divided into abdominal and pelvic but there is no muscle or anything dividing the abdominal from the pelvic the abdominal cavity goes into the pelvic cavity just falls into the pelvic cavity through the pelvis the bony pelvis so it kind of organs from the abdominal cavity can pass into the pelvic cavity just through this pelvic uh, the pelvis the bony pelvis whereas when organs from the thoracic cavity have to come into the abdominal cavity or if organs have from the abdominal cavity have to go into the thoracic cavity to give you an example an organ coming from the thoracic into the abdominal like the esophagus it has to pass through the diaphragm and actually there is like an aperture in the diaphragm or like a hole in the diaphragm to allow it to pass through okay there are other cavities that we have in the body but we don't call them typical body cavities for example when we do joints we will see that there is a joint cavity called the synovial joint cavity so there is some fluid which is produced in the synovial joint cavity similarly your oral cavity the cavity of your mouth that's called the oral cavity the cavity of your nose is called the nasal cavities in your eyes these are called orbital cavities there's a cavity present inside your middle ear which houses air so these are also tiny cavities which are present inside your body so you know you could say they are body cavities but we don't count them in body cavities they're just small cavities which are present only in certain regions so typically body cavities are dorsal and ventral being divided into these parts now since this ventral body cavity also has important organs for example in the thoracic region you have the lungs one lung on each side and then the heart in the middle and the area between the two lungs so this area between the two lungs where the heart lies that area is called the mediastinum so the area between the two lungs where the heart is lying that area is called the mediastinum there are other important structures which also lie between the two lungs and in the mediastinum we'll do those later so in the thoracic cavity the important structures are the lungs and the heart you have other structures as well but these are the important structures in the abdominal pelvic uh, cavity you have the gastrointestinal system an extremely mobile the gastrointestinal system which is extremely mobile moves around a lot so there could be fi uh, friction there so they need lubrication just as the lungs the lungs also expand and they contract the heart also expands fills with blood then contracts to push the blood out and see these organs are so closely packed with one another so if they didn't have anything to kind of help them they would rub against each other and cause friction so therefore within these body cavities you have serous cavities the word serous means thin so serous cavities are like little water filled balloons which are filled with small amount of fluid they surround an organ and they help to lubricate the organ so this is a picture which is kind of uh, or rather a drawing which is kind of trying to show you So imagine this is the developing lung of one side and in the thoracic cavity here is a thin water filled structure this is a thin membrane which has a little fluid present inside and let's call this the pleural cavity because the pleural cavity is what surrounds the lungs 
So as the lung expands and grows, what it does is like a fist being pushed into a balloon. It pushes into this pleural cavity. And when it does that, it kind of artificially divides this membrane into two layers. One layer which is intimately attached to the surface of the organ, which is called the visceral layer. And another layer which is attached to the outside or which lines the body cavity, which is known as the parietal layer. Got that? In between the two, you'll have small amount of fluid. So what happens is, as this organ expands, it'll kind of push and make this pleural cavity even smaller. And now the organ has expanded. But because there is fluid which is present between that, it doesn't cause friction between the other organ lying close by. So one very good example, I can give you an analogy is, imagine you have a box, a cardboard carton. Okay, that, let's say that's your thoracic cavity. And let, let's pretend that we have only one organ inside this cavity, okay? So you have this cardboard box, which is your thoracic cavity. Inside this cardboard box, imagine if I put a bean bag, okay? I pushed a bean bag inside that. So that is your pleural cavity, okay? And then now you sit on the bean bag, right? So you are the lung sitting on the bean bag, okay? Can you imagine like that? So what will happen? The bean bag, one portion of the bean bag, let's say you went out and bought a nice expensive leather bean bag. So one portion of the leather is going to surround your bottom, right? Isn't it? Because you're sitting on the bean bag. So that would be the visceral layer. Got it? The other part of the bean bag would be lining the inside or would be in contact with the inside of that cardboard box. That would be the parietal layer. Can you see that? And in between the two layers would be beans or whatever it is that they have those little thingies, right? So, same, same principle. The parietal layer therefore lines the inside of the body cavity where it is present. So, pleura, for example, will line the inside of the thoracic body cavity. The visceral layer will line the organ, will be in intimate contact with the organ. Fluid is, will be present between these two layers. And so in this, would you, is this statement that the lungs lie in the pleural cavity, is this true or false? False, because the lungs are not lying here, right? They are lying outside the cavity. They are only surrounded by the pleural cavity. Where do the lungs lie? They lie in this box or in that thoracic cavity. Okay? So the three cavities that you see in the thoracic region, you see a pleural cavity on each side for each lung and a pericardial cavity for the heart. So all these cavities, these two cavities surround the lungs and the heart respectively. And in the abdomen, we have a serous membrane like this called the peritoneal cavity. But since in the abdomen we have so many organs, not just one. So imagine if this was a peritoneal cavity and here was a stomach developing and liver and small intestine and something else. So here in the peritoneal cavity, this would kind of get folded in different ways like that because you have so many organs which kind of, you know, push into it. So the peritoneal cavity is a little bit more complicated. It's all one continuous thing, but just folded in in different ways. Okay, so here's a picture showing you these cavities. So this is a section, take a coronal section taken through the thorax. Here's the diaphragm. Here are the two lungs, right and left, and this is the heart. This line, if you can see, this is the parietal layer of the pleura lining the inside of the thoracic cavity. Then it turns around and then becomes the visceral layer where it is intimately attached to the lung and then comes back up like that. And in between the two layers, the slight blue that you can see, that is the actual pleural cavity. Same way with the heart. This is the visceral layer of the pericardium. Turns around and becomes the parietal layer which now lines, sits on the diaphragm and then is, is in contact with the parietal pleura. And in between the two, that is the pericardial cavity, again, surrounding the heart. And here you can see the peritoneal cavity. See, this is the parietal layer of peritoneum. And notice how it kind of gets folded all over inside because there are so many organs which are pushing in. Now, some of these organs kind of push in really deep like I drew here, they push in really deep 
and when they push in really deep they kind of hang by a double fold of peritoneum so this double fold of peritoneum is known as mesentery so instead of just pushing a thing like this it kind of pushes it real deep inside so it kind of has drags a little double fold of peritoneum which is known as mesentery and that just gives it mobility within the cavity it sort of allows it to move around a lot so here's a good example of the thoracic cavity notice the two lungs this is the heart there's a pericardium which has been opened up the visceral pericardium is in intimate contact with the surface of the heart the parietal will be on the outside here are the lungs the parietal layer of pleura is lining here the thoracic cavity and the diaphragm and it then gets reflected and then comes on the lung where it becomes the visceral layer here this is showing you the abdominal cavity so again the parietal peritoneum will line the inside of this abdominal cavity the visceral layer will be in intimate contact with these organs so this is a superficial view so if we remove this then we can see a deeper view and you can understand both these are coronal sections can you see that the front part has been removed and you're looking at the posterior aspect and here you can see both kidneys this is kind of very deep inside so we've removed all these organs so that we can look kind of deeper into the posterior wall of the abdomen and also notice how this is the abdominal cavity this here is the pelvic cavity and this is a part of the large intestine so notice how this large intestine is just gently going in from the abdomen into the pelvis there through the bony pelvis there's kind of an inlet through which it just goes inside so here again same thing showing you abdominal pelvic cavity large intestine from the abdomen going and becoming the rectum in the pelvic cavity and this is a sagittal section showing you the same thing a male sagittal section so here you can see in this case this is this part here is the abdominal cavity this area here is the pelvic cavity where you can see the urinary bladder you can see the rectum if there if it was a female you would also see the uterus here now when we kind of look at all these organs they're so densely packed inside the abdomen that if someone had a problem we want to be able to pinpoint which organs are involved in that problem so for our own purposes in order to be able to diagnose more efficiently we divide the abdomen into four quadrants so you can see this part would be the right upper left upper right lower left lower and we get a, by knowing how these organs are kind of stacked inside we can kind of see from here that the liver lies most of it lies in the right upper quadrant a small part in the left one uh, a small part of the stomach in the right upper most of it in the left upper quadrant so you can see that but this doesn't kind of serve our purpose as much as if we were to divide this abdominal pelvic region instead into smaller regions so that then we can very definitely say these organs lie in this region and if a person comes pointing to that region and they have a problem then you can narrow your diagnosis to just those organs which you think will be involved so these are called the nine body regions and it is done for the abdominal pelvic area so we don't include the thorax in it and we divide it into nine regions by four lines two lines which come we drop them from the middle of the clavicle all the way down so we take the center point of the clavicle and go all the way down and these are two vertical lines and two horizontal lines one going just above the rib cage so here are the ribs so going just above the rib cage close to somewhere around the 10th rib and another one going through the highest point of your hip and you get these nine regions these two on either side are called hypochondriac chondra for cartilage because the ribs the anterior ends of the ribs the, this part the anterior ends of the ribs are cartilaginous not bone and hypo means below so since it's just below the ribs so we call it hypochondriac here on either side we call it the lumbar regions because they are related to the lumbar vertebrae 
And up here, the lower regions on either side are called iliac because this part of the hip bone is called the ilium. Or there's also a muscular tunnel present there called inguinal tunnel. So we call it either right iliac or right inguinal region. The central area is called the umbilical region, obviously, because the umbilicus is present there. The portion above is called epigastric because a large part of this region is lying above the stomach. This part is called hypogastric because it's below the stomach. Gastric has to do with stomach. Hypo means below. Epi means above. So if you take a look at this picture, you can notice some things. So notice how the liver is present mainly in the right hypochondriac and the epigastric region. Stomach present in left hypochondriac, epigastric. The stomach may even come into the umbilical region. The spleen is present. This is the spleen up here. The spleen is present mainly in the left hypochondriac region. The intestines, both large and small, actually lie in every portion of the nine regions. Large and small both lie in all parts of the nine regions. Because small intestine, because it's so mobile that it can move around in any place. Large intestine, where you can see, so you can see it going up like this. Notice how it comes down here, so it's... Uh, in the epigastric as well as umbilical, then along the side, and then it comes down here to become the rectum where it goes into the pelvis. So large intestine also in all of the nine regions. So having looked at this picture and having had an idea where some of these important organs are present, let's answer this question. Which body region do you think the urinary bladder is located in? Hypogastric, yes, very good. Hypogastric, not umbilical. Your urinary bladder only rises to your umbilicus when the urinary bladder is full and has about 500 ml of fluid inside. But otherwise, it's a totally pelvic organ. Only in a very, very small child is it abdominal. Otherwise, it's pelvic and it lies in the hypogastric region. 